Welcome to our ninth episode of One Work, Five Questions with Dr. Mark Andrew Holacek and your host, Donna Vitek. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Holacek. Glad to be here. Me too. It's always a great way to spend a Sunday talking about Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> Dr. Holacek is a retired professor of philosophy and history, and he's also the world's foremost scholar on Thomas Jefferson. So any questions you have regarding Thomas Jefferson can be directed to Dr. Holacek. He's got over 20 published books and over 100 essays on Jefferson. Um, his list of the list of books and his published essays can be found in the uh, video description at the end of the video. Um, with our show, One Work, Five Questions, I'll ask Dr. Holacek five questions on one work of Thomas Jefferson's. Our ninth topic is Thomas Jefferson's views on politics. In his I letter, would change that to call it his political philosophy. So we can leave that for just to understand we're not going to be talking about politics, more about political philosophy, just okay. for the listeners. His political philosophy. Um, I'll give you a brief introduction on the topic right now. Jefferson's letter is in reply to a brief missive by Kirchhoff, in which the latter encloses a recently published pamphlet concerning a call for a convention for the sake of revising and amending Virginia's constitution. He asked for Jefferson's opinions, but Jefferson, now retired, demurs. I resign myself as a passenger with confidence to those at present at the helm and ask, for, and ask but for rest, peace, and goodwill. Yet Thomas Jefferson is sucked into discussion of the issue and pledges to share his views on good governing, provided that Kirchhoff does not share his letter. And so we have a lengthy and profitable fleshing out of Thomas Jefferson's mature political thinking on republicanism, the subject of this week's discussion. If you have ready access to Jefferson's July 12, 1816 letter to Samuel Kirchhoff, we invite you to turn to follow our discussion. Are you ready for question one? I am ready. Okay. Question one. We talked in private about not getting hung up about particulars of the letter, as it is so long. It is easy to get lost in tangents. You wished merely to discuss the letter as a statement of Thomas Jefferson's mature political philosophy. What, to begin, is the difference between a political philosophy and political thinking? Well, this was part of the cautionary remark I made at the beginning when you said Republic Jefferson politics, Republic Jefferson's political philosophy. And uh, to talk about someone's political views would be to talk about what they, the political stances that they have on all different issues that define the person, everybody's political views, each person's political views differs from all other persons. Mm -hmm. So just to talk about someone's politics, you know, each person's politics is unique. Now, political philosophy is something that ought to, it's normative, it ought to undergird, uh, support any political views. So okay. when I talk about, we're talking about Jefferson's political philosophy, these are views he has that any, let's put it this way for him, any sane person ought to embrace these axial, these foundational principles mm -hmm. when you have a, uh, a, when you have your own political views. Mm -hmm. So they're the most fundamental propositions of any sort of political system that anyone ought to embrace. Does okay. that make sense? Yes, that makes, that makes sense. And um, it, it seems like that should ought to come before the choosing of a political direction. That's right. the guiding so You're going to get people to say, forget it. You know, political philosophy is, is bunkum. It's bullshit. Let's, you know, Hamilton would probably say that, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. you know you're getting lost in the metaphysics of, of philosophy. Let's just, you know, talk about politics, not talk about political philosophy. But Jefferson thought otherwise, I think, at least. Yes. It was a wonderful letter. It's the one I most enjoyed. Um, Everywhere in the letter, Thomas Jefferson seems to be turning to the people, the people, the people, uh, that Jeffersonian republicanism is about the people of the nation. Thomas Jefferson even claims that republicanism is not to be found in our constitution, but in our people. Why is that? 
Did he think little of the Constitution? Well, this letter is significant because it gives the gist of a very rich political philosophy. A lot of people think he had no political philosophy. That's incorrect. It's spelled out quite clearly here. It's enunciated. His first inaugural address is spelled out quite clearly here. Um, we have an attempt to define republicanism. You find it here and in two other letters. And I've always been intrigued that in 1816, he's so focused on defining very clearly and neatly what republicanism is. Mm -hmm. And the definition um, in philosophical terms is, is offering sufficient and necessary conditions for something. It's not just talking about necessary conditions. For example, if I'm talking about you know, necessary condition for chicken soup, that's chicken. Chicken has to be a part of it. So it's necessary for it. Uh, <clears throat> now, um, to, to give necessary and condition and sufficient condition is to uniquely point out what Jeffersonian Republicanism is. It's to define it, it's to, to describe it in such a way it picks it out from all other things. So, so sufficient conditions and necessary conditions are or what makes something a definition. So he's trying in, in my, to the best of my understanding, to define republicanism, to, to, to get uniquely at what it is. And he gives several arguments. I <clears throat> will refer to them. One is the argument from the will of the people. He says, in truth, the abuses of monarchy have so much filled all the space of political contemplation that we imagined everything Republican, which was not monarchy. We had not yet penetrated to the mother principle that, and he has quotes here, governments are Republican only in proportion as they embody the will of the people and execute it. So we've got this argument from the will of the people. Um, and then he gives another uh, uh, equal voice argument through representatives. He says, for let it be agreed that a government is Republican in proportion as every member composing it has an equal voice in the direction of its concerns, not indeed in person, which would be impractical beyond the limits of a city or small township, but by representatives chosen by himself and responsible to him at short intervals. Okay, so that's uh, a second definition. So it's representative, it's government that's representative because in a large government, you, you can't have a democracy. You can have a representative democracy because over a large space of land, all people can't directly participate. People are busy doing other things. But if you have representatives, people who are, are <clears throat> going to vote and, and so forth that with respect to your interests, that, that works. Uh, then he has an argument, uh, what, he, what might be called the argument from the spirit of the people. And I quote again, what then is our republicanism, where then is our republicanism to be found? Not in our constitution, certainly, but merely in the spirit of our people that would oblige even a despot to govern us republicanly, owing to the spirit and nothing in the form of our constitution, all things have gone well. Um, this is an important claim because, you know, people, Constitution is, is the law of the land, as we well know. You look at the debates by the Federalists and Anti-Federalists over, over the Constitution in the Federalist uh, papers. Um, but Jefferson has a different view of the Constitution. It is, uh, and we'll talk more about this perhaps a little bit later, but it needs to be revised. We'll talk about that next week, actually, a little bit more. It needs to be revised as the will of the people uh, advances and changes, okay? Uh, so he has that argument, see if I can find. Um, he says later, the true foundation of Republican government is the equal right of every citizen in his person and property and in their management. Um, he says, if experience be called for, appeal to that of our 15 or 20 governments for 40 years and show me where the people have done half the mischief in these 40 years that a single despot would have done in a single year. Okay, talks about there might be riots and rebellions in a thriving Jeffersonian Republic, but uh, over a 40 year span, these riots and republics will not have done the damage of, that a despot can do in one year. 
Uh, yeah, you know, look at what Putin is doing right now. That's what he means by a despot. I have complete control over government affairs and the people fear me. Even the people next to me fear me. I do what I want to do. And so the potential for damage is extraordinary. So, you know, we have this attempt in some sense to define republicanism as a government uh, through elected representatives that are watched over by the people, can be recalled by the people, uh, and it works over large government, and it works, he thinks, rather well, so long as the people <clears throat> function for the sake of the will, the, the, the will of the general citizenry. Mm -hmm. So that does sound very much like our constitutional republic that we have. Yeah, if it would be followed by the letter of the law, uh, it hasn't <clears throat> hasn't probably never been followed, but uh, I think you would be embarrassed and astonished and um, uh, at wit's end if you'd see how our government functions today. Because in oh. some sense, as we talk about that, neither the left or the right really cares about the will of the people, and uh, Jefferson would be taken aback by that, no, no question. Yeah, we do need to keep them in mind, uh, um, our founding fathers and what they hoped. And the, and well, the idea is, is the Constitution is the law of the land. Jefferson would agree to that. The only thing is, is that, you know, he, he, he had a view is that people's thoughts and ideas change over time. The Constitution right. needs to reflect that. So there has to be over at, at the end of every generation, which he thought was 19 years, we'll see next week. Uh, he thought there needed to be constitutional renewal and reform. In discussion by uh, delegates, people delegated, not the politicians, but people delegated uh, by the general public to discuss changes to the Constitution. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm excited about that discussion. That was one of my big questions from the letter. Okay, question number three. Montesquieu chirped that the problem with democracy and and here he followed Aristotle, is that it works only for small governments. How does Jeffersonian republicanism work around that problem? Well, there, there are several ways. The, the idea is you have representatives and he has this formula, which he says elsewhere is you divide and you divide and you divide. You divide and divide again, he says. The idea behind that is, is that um, it, it, it's bottom up. If, if a government's going to be people driven and not driven from the top by a despot or an aristocracy or an oligarchy, um, you have to, the people have to have, there has to be a sort of uh, mechanism draw, drawn up by which the people can exercise their power. Um, here again in the letter, he says, divide the counties into wards of such size as that every citizen uh, um, can attend when called on and act in person to ascribe to them the government of their wards in all things relating to themselves exclusively. A justice chosen by themselves in each, a constable, a military company, a patrol, a school, a care of their own poor, their own portion of the public roads, the choice of one or more jurors to serve in some court and the delivery within their own wards of their own votes for all elective offices of higher sphere will relieve the county administration nearly all its business, will have it better done, and by making every citizen an acting member of the government and then the offices nearest and most interesting to him will attach him by strongest feelings to the independence of his country and its Republican constitution. So what he means by that um, is that you're going to have these county the counties will be broken up into wards, which at one point he says will be five or six square miles. Other times he describes them differently. And each will be self-sufficient. Each will be a small political unit with its own justice, right? Uh, and, you know, and there'll be families living in that ward. Okay. And then there'll be a number of wards, say a hundred in a county. And the counties will have their own government and conduct affairs that they need to conduct at the level of the county. And the counties will, uh, the state will comprise the counties. There'll be a number of counties in the state. And then at the highest level, you have the federal government comprising um, the various states, the 13 states that we have. So you break things down so that the lowest level, at the ward level, you have schools, you have your own police force, you have your own militia to take care of things. 
And you have families dictating, uh, members dictating, you know, education and things like that. And he thought the wards should should find, educate themselves. You know, within a ward, you should have your own school where people will be responsible right. for, for paying for general education. That never came about for Jefferson. But the idea is to break things down so that if I'm a farmer and I can't participate um, in, you know, state fairs or federal affairs, I can at least participate at the ward level at the very least by local elections, by jury duty and things like that. <clears throat> Let me see if there's another passage, right? Yeah, he talks about that later. We should marshal our government into the, the federal government, uh, which concerns foreign and federal, that of the state for what relates their own citizens exclusively, the county republics for duties and concerns of the county and ward republics for the small and yet numerous and interesting concerns of the neighborhood, right? Um, so he says by division and subdivision of duties alone that all matters great and small can be managed to perfection. So, and the whole is cemented by giving to every citizen personally a part in the administration of public affairs. Every person is responsible for some level of participation in politics, right? Now notice this is tremendously important and people overpass this all the time for Jefferson. It's one of the reasons our government doesn't work today. Participation is key. In France, they were talking about with the election of the new prime minister going on, uh, that there might be something like 25% of the people voting. Now that's, you know, if, if something like that were to occur, it's probably gonna be more than that. Imagine 75% of the people not concerned with who runs the country, sort of a scary thing. If, you know, obviously the numbers are probably gonna be better than that, but still there's a lot of indifference and apathy and some of it is generated by uh, thinking it before it's gonna be a foregone conclusion who wins and so forth. So it's this whole notion of dividing and dividing again and, and full political participation. If you want to complain about things not going well in the country, if you're not doing your part, right. And part of your part is overseeing what these people who are your elected officials are doing. If you wanna sit and complain about them, but if you don't write letters, if you don't let them know what you think and they make decisions that are somewhat discretionary, you don't have a right to complain. That's his view. And it's a very sensible view, I think. Oh, I very, you. very. Would you equate a ward to the city? Um, like we have our county, we have our state, our county, and then you have your city. Um, would a ward be no, something? No, a ward would be something uh, just like a, a township or something. Like the townships okay. that they had, a township could have in it several small towns in it. Uh, okay. Jefferson was anti-city. He hated city. So he's defining for Virginia something. He's thinking about small farms spread out over, uh, you know, and maybe a, a town or two. You know, you know, you're talking about within five or six square miles, you've got you know, six miles here, six miles there. There might be one town in a ward, there oh. might be none. Okay, okay. But it's just that all the people that live in that space will have a school, they'll have, you know, a policing system and everything. Okay. So there's, you know, you notice five or six square miles, it's in walking distance or riding distance of a horse. Right. That's important for him. So you don't have to, to go a, a long distance. Okay, okay. Um, He's not thinking about the cities that you have, say, in the north. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm not thinking about city like New York City. I'm thinking about, like, I live in the city of Palm Bay. Um, you know, uh, so that... Yeah, but he's still not thinking about that. He's, Virginia is uh, different. Virginia is agricultural. Yeah, he's thinking that, you know, there's, there are cities like Richmond and Charlottesville was tiny at the time. Right. <laughs> That we're we're talking about here. Charlottesville is a, a tiny little bug of a town. So oh, okay. Question number four. There is toward the end of the letter a statement about the progress of the human mind. Can you tell us what he meant by this statement? Mm. Yeah, th this is gonna take us to the next letter, the 1789 letter to James Madison on generational sovereignty. And um, yeah, he defines, he says a lot about this. Um, 
we need constant, you know, he's talking about when the citizens run into debts and they need to be taxed. He says, this is when we're gonna run into trouble uh, because we want too many things. And as we want too many things, we run into debt and the you know, mm-hmm. state governments and so forth to run into debt. So there's going to be increased taxation. Right. And um, he says, what? Uh, people come to labor 16 hours in the 24, give the earnings of 15 of these to the government for their debts, because they have debts and daily expenses and the 16th being insufficient to afford us bread. We, we must live as they now do on oatmeal and potatoes. Probably an <laughs> allusion to the Irish having to live on potatoes because of the, uh, the penury. No time to think, no means of calling the, the uh, mismanagers to account, but be glad to obtain subsistence by hiring ourselves to rivet their chains on their necks of our fellow sufferers. The idea is, is that we're going to be like people of England working in the factories for 16 hours. We have no time to concern ourselves when you're dead tired and you're eating oatmeal and potatoes, yum. Uh, and, you know, you have no time to think about political participation. Oatmeal for breakfast. So, you know, <laughs> I, I enjoy oatmeal. I'm not a huge potato fan. I'm, I use them. I do grow some of them. But uh, the idea is we have such debt. We, we don't have the time or energy or the concern to, to care about political matters. Um, um, so, I mean, let me see. He said, he says, private fortunes are, can be destroyed by public as well as private extravagance. And this is the tendency of all human governments. The idea is, is you're wanting too much um, and, and so forth. So he says, this is a concern. So we must make our election we have a choice, the economy and liberty or profusion and servitude. So this shows you that liberty is an ideal that asks us to really think carefully about not wanting too many things. Right. By wanting too many things, we are already, we have profusion, but we are in servitude, right? right. We get into our working 16 hours. You know, look at, we have both man and woman working in most relationships um, so people can have more things. We have more things, we pay less attention to what our governors are doing. Now, to get back to the question, it's a bit of a deviation, but it does relate to the question. Jefferson thinks, uh, you talked about progress of the human mind. Uh, He says, laws and institutions must go hand in hand with the progress of the human mind. As that becomes more developed, more enlightened and new discoveries are made new truths disclosed and manners and opinions change with the change of circumstances. Institutions must advance also and keep pace with the times. We might as well require man to to wear still the coat which fitted him when a boy uh, as civilized society to remain ever under the regimen of their barbarous ancestors. Now, numerous people, Adrian Koch was a fine Jeffersonian scholar here today, argue that, and I think you sent me a missive over the email about, uh, you know, suggesting was Jefferson a political relativist, that, you know, constitutions need to change as humans' ideas change. A lot of people, and here's a a different passage I want to reflect on this, is very important to. Jefferson says in numerous places, the constitution needs to change as the will of majority change, so which means that the will can go off any direction. You ask, would Jefferson be open to communism and stuff? Well, Jefferson is pretty much open to whatever the majority thinks. Mm-hmm. The idea is, and he says in his first inaugural address, the will for it to be uh, rightful must be reasonable. And I said, one way of cashing that out, he says, we have to have an educated citizenry. Against the argument, and I've written on this in just about every political a book where I talk about Jefferson's political philosophy, he is not a political relativist. He doesn't think that anything goes in a political system. So he has a political philosophy. You have to have elected, he thinks this is an advance. Notice how he says progress of the human minds, more Mm -hmm. developed, more enlightened, new discoveries, new truths. Uh, That's the, the change is progressive change for him. He's living not in Aristotle's world anymore at his time. We're living in Galileo, in Boyle, in Newton's world. 
We have made new discoveries about the physical universe. We have new discoveries in morality, new discoveries in politics. He says the Greeks, Aristotle people are obsolete because they never thought of Republican, uh, a representative government. That's a bit of a stretch because everybody in Jefferson's day read Aristotle, read Plato and knew those works extraordinarily well, even Montesquieu. Everybody draws from Aristotle and uh, many of the other Greeks as well, uh, whose political thinking was seminal in, in understanding John Adams and, and all sorts of Alexander Hamilton and all people. Uh, to Jefferson to suggest that these works are obsolete is sort of, uh, sort of unnerving. But the idea is he's not a relativist because he thinks we're making progress in the sciences and as we make progresses in the sciences, politics and morality being sciences, we need to change the constitution. Mm -hmm. we, Newton discovered the laws of the universe. Aristotle's cosmos doesn't work anymore. We've got different words, quotidians and oxygen. Uh, so we need to change the constitution as people become more enlightened. So it's not an arbitrary change as a lot of scholars. Many scholars, Dumas Malone too makes this mistakes. It's not relativism, it's progressivism. Okay. So you, you have to understand it in it because Jefferson speaks like a relativist in many areas. Passages like this debunk that. So we have this whole notion of generational sovereignty. We'll talk about it next week. With each generation, we've got a new generation, new ideas, uh, more advances in science. For the most part, each generation is going to be smarter than the one preceding it. It's not an inviolable rule. Um, but it is a truth, he thinks. So the constitution will need to change as, uh, as ideas progress. And those will suggest in advance. This again gives you some idea what's going on in the mind of people as they colonize the Americas uh -huh. and push the Native Americans back and so forth. As we'd say today, we stole their lands, but they didn't think that way. They were doing, you know, right or wrong, they thought they were doing the natives the justice by introducing them to the culture, uh, these advances in science. We don't think that way today. Um, I think in some cases, perhaps we should. I'm not talking about stealing people's land, but I'm talking about science as it is progressing. Oh, right, right. Yeah. So I mean, a need. Idea, yeah, I mean. There's no question, you know, we're learning about habitable planets. We're learning, you know, more about the way the physical universe works. We've sequenced the DNA. So we're learning things and we can't just say, you know, we live in a time where science is just, you know, postmodern so say science is arbitrary. Uh, as I said before, uh, people who say that go to their medical doctor when they don't feel well, they don't see a witch doctor or they don't, you know, ask their neighbor, what should I do? I have this terrible cough, you know. I'm going to go to my neighbor. What should I do? I'm going to see a doctor because, you know, science is on the advance. So constitutions needed to advance mm -hmm. as science progressed and the sciences were included politics, morality. I think my, my biggest curiosity through, um, through Jefferson's um, feeling that the constitution must change to reflect the will of the people. Um, my biggest question is, do those changes occur through the amendment process or is he talking about another revolution or through revolution? He's talking about changing the constitution that every 19 years you're gonna get a group of people uh, with delegated authority by the general public will sit down and talk about what needs to be changed. Constant, he, he, he doesn't have, he says, uh, right, right um, talks about, hmm, some men look at constitutions with sanctimonious reverence and deem them like the Ark of the Covenant, too sacred to be touched. They ascribe to the men of the preceding age a wisdom more than human and suppose what they did to be beyond amendment. Now, we have these people today, radical conservatives, say, well, in the Constitution, you know, people talk about gun. The Constitution says the right to bear arms. Now, I'm not getting into, you know, the right to bear arms. I don't care. The idea is, as Jefferson says, that worked for that time. Mm -hmm. I need to sit down and ask, does it still work? To, to think that the Constitution is an inviolable document, that it can't be, that these is to presume that they had a wisdom far greater than we'll ever have, and it's nonsense. Jefferson says that. 
Well, and we have the amendment process to make those changes as they're needed, as science, as we learn more. But, but um, Peterson wants more than that. He wants uh, a formal gathering, say, every 19 years. Let's okay. sit down and it's time to look at everything, okay. not just to discuss, you know, should we have prohibition, right? What is that, the 18th and 21st Amendments? I, I'm a little foggy on that from all the <laughs> drinking I've done. I'm just teasing. But uh, I think it's the 18th, 21st, uh, who knows? But I mean, we say, no more alcohol, right? It's bad. And then all of a sudden, years later, no, we changed our mind on that. This is yeah. not that sort of process for Jefferson. This is, let's sit down and look at everything and discuss, you know, given our constituency, the things that need to be changed to reflect what we know now that our, that our forefathers didn't know. Now notice, and, and, and not to be verbose here, but notice how if every generation is in some sense a little smarter, there are new responsibilities for each generation. We'll talk about that when it comes to okay. issues like slavery. Okay. Oh, that you leads cannot, me to question, what? You cannot look at the constitution with sanctimonious reverence. It needs to be changed. It's just the law of the land. In effect, as I said before, the very second that you create a constitution, probably the next day, it's obsolete. Right. Right. Oh, but, I know. I'm, I'm a big one, though. Uh, yeah, I guess that's something I need to learn because I'm very much a uh, uh, constitution, constitution, constitution. Well, <laughs> you, you, no, and Jefferson thought, you're, you're right to think that. Jefferson thought you need to be. Right. He was a strict constructionist. You can't have a willy interpretation, but you just have to understand that it needs to be changed. Yeah. You yeah. cannot violate the law. Right. When he made the uh, um, uh, when he made the purchase, the Louisiana purchase, mm -hmm. he knew there wasn't constitutional warrant for what he was doing. And he wanted an amendment. He said, we do that. And he was advised. Right. No, you don't have enough time for that. By Gallatin, we don't have enough time. Before Napoleon changes his mind, let's take the land. Don't right. worry about the constitutionality. And Jefferson grudgingly, and I say grudgingly because he really didn't want to do it without constitutional warrant. He did it. And people always criticize him. Well, you know, he went forth with the Louisiana Purchase without constitutional warrant, and he knew it. Yeah, he knew it, but he wanted to do it within the confines of constitutional authority and have an amendment. Uh, I asked, what would you do? Are you going to buy the land, which was dirt cheap, pennies per acre? Or are you going, if you don't have constitutional warrant, or are you going to go through by doubling the size of the nation? Everybody agreed it was the right thing. Right. The problem was uh, stepping aside constitutional warrant. It's a slippery slope. You can, if you do that for one thing, you might do that for everything. Right, right. Okay. Well, yeah, I think... Um... That's that that is a good reflection of how life needs to be. Sometimes you have rules, I think, or a general guideline, but there are times where there are things that fall outside of those parameters that you have to just make a decision on and, and do it. Um, and that's what he did. And I'm grateful that he did. And a slippery slope, though. I mean, it really is. He, it, he was bothered by because people like Hamilton just thought the Constitution was something like wet clay in the hands of the president. I can do whatever I want with it. I could, I, he called the general, general welfare clause. Well, you know, it, maybe this is not sanctioned by the constitution, but I'm gonna go ahead with it because this is for the good welfare of the citizenry, right? right? And that's a very dangerous thing, right? Well, there. as we see today in our, in our budget, <laughs> everything's for the general welfare <laughs> now. Yeah, 30, $30 trillion of debt. We've, we've expanded what general welfare means. I think we probably need to come up with a standard definition. <laughs> um, well, the, uh, the idea here that he worried about is, is a, a definition that favored po politicians who are concerned about pocketing and, and monetizing from uh, decisions. And then Hall Alexander Hamilton is no stranger to that. We all know that. He, yeah. Anyways. Okay. <laughs> Question number five. Okay, you promised to tell us something special about the year 1816. I'm dying to know what is it? Yeah, uh, I was perplexed in, in my book, Thomas Jefferson's Political Philosophy, the Metaphysics of Utopia. 
which I don't have with me, but it's a very good book on if you want to know Jefferson's political philosophy. Uh, I called it a philosophical hangover. And I was sort of perplexed, but because in this letter and in a uh, prior letter to John Taylor uh, and a letter prior to that to Pierre Samuel Dupont de Nemours on April 24, he goes into, he's got this, you know, this notion of defining republicanism. He's never done that before. So what's, what's about the year 1816? And I'm looking to the end of, uh, of the war with England and Madison's administration, trying to come up with an explanation as to why is he obsessed with this. Mm -hmm. And it turns out the answer was simpler than that. There was, I think in 18, I have a video of this on uh, the Facebook page, Thomas Jefferson, bring him home to Monticello. I did a video of it yesterday and it's on YouTube. Okay. Jefferson's philosophical hangover explained. Um, there was a volcanic eruption. Um, the mountain name of the mountain escaped me, but it enshrouded the whole world in smoke in a thick cloud. And they called it the year without sunshine, some people did. And of course, the religionists thought it was Armageddon, that God, you know, people oh. were sinning so much that the end is here. Let's mm -hmm. go their churches and repent. Uh, yeah. It just was a volcanic eruption. That was the year that uh, Shelley wrote Frankenstein and Lord Byron created a, a very dreadful, dismal poem talking about the clouds and the no sunshine and, and you know, very dismal, depressing poem. And I'm sure were any of you to go back and, and research 1816 and look about you know, in art, poetry, in, in people's journals and diaries, you have some indication of that. So Jefferson perhaps is thinking, well, maybe, maybe it is the end of the world. I'm speculating here. So maybe I better get really clear on just what my thinking is uh, in case, uh, you know, crops failed, the, the average temperature was three degrees Celsius cooler, which is quite substantial. So it was, uh, that was it, that was it for, uh, for that's the uh, the cliffhanger solved the puzzle solved that we gave from last week the volcanic eruption wow wow that led to Jefferson's eruption with his pen oh thank you so much um, I did a little bit of reading um, about that and I was curious to know how it affected the farms um, since that was important to Thomas Jefferson um, since we ended with some discussion of generational sovereignty, you thought it proper to move next week to critical discussion of a very important letter to James Madison in 1789 on the topic. Failure to get clear on the letter leads to scholarly confusion, not only on Thomas Jefferson's political philosophy, but also many other issues. Um, and we have our cliffhanger for next week. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, the, the letter, it, it's a difficult read. It's September 6, 1789, and it's Jefferson's Yusufruck letter, where he discusses uh, in great detail the notion of generational sovereignty. And scholars, for the most part, do not understand how important a a, a role this played in his political philosophy, this notion of generational sovereignty we'll talk about next week, but failure to understand that Jefferson could not do without this, that this was really a part of what's going on, that the next generation had responsibilities that, you know, the prior generation, you've talked about revolution, revolution starts, the people start the revolution, once they're done with the revolution, it's for the next generation to figure out what we're going to do, what constitution we're going to have, and so forth. So there are responsibilities of every generation and this will play mm -hmm. out to some further our understanding. People don't like this, but this will help us understand the, the, ask the question, why didn't he do more to end slavery in, 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 uh, in his retirement years? We'll talk about that next time fully. Wow. So just leave that, that, this notion of generation. This is a tremendously important letter. Yeah, you know, I, so, it's so funny because um, you hear that a lot. Um, especially with me being in a graduate program 
and involved in discussion boards. And that, that was a big thing in my history, um, US history class. Um, and that's the, what is most often associated with Thomas Jefferson. Why didn't he do it more to end slavery? And um, I know in the, in the um, not everything can be solved in our generation. And we have so many issues now. And I caught myself saying um, in conversation that I always thought the, um, with, uh, with women and feminism and, um, and a woman's right to choose to be a mother or a, or a, a stay-at-home mom or a wife when, when she graduates from high school, having that equal choice of going to college or, or having a family. Um, and I thought, I always thought that that problem would be solved in my generation. And I caught myself saying, I, it looks like it is not going to be solved by the time I leave the earth. And, 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 and that's all will, right. And it will I, be I, for other generations, the I'll, next I'll generation. Leave, I'll leave people with this thought. Um, Ukeros, it's a Greek word, means uh, keros is, is the right time. I'll explain that next week. And boo means EU means good. Uh, things need to be done. You know, this is, follows Aristotle's um, uh, ethics. Mm -hmm. uh, the right thing is, is, is doing the right thing at the right time for the right reasons in the right manner, who, what, why, when, where was all, all, you know, so right action is not just doing you know, slavery. We'll talk about this next time. But slavery might be a, an evil. Trying to eradicate slavery at the wrong time could very easily do more harm than good, could be the wrong thing to do. Right. Right. That's the answer to the question people don't like to hear. Doing the right thing at the wrong time is doing the wrong thing. That's what Jefferson learned from the ancients. He read the ancients meticulously, he knew them. And if you push something at the wrong time, mm -hmm. it can be the wrong thing. There could be a civil war. And guess what happened? Right. Oh, gosh, and he did that predict one. that. Um, he did predict that. And I think it was a letter. He didn't predict it, Jones. but he warned of it being a possibility. But that that's for next time. We don't want to talk too much about what we're going to do next time. I'm just giving <laughs> that teaser. So we will talk about that stuff. I yeah. know. I told you I could I can uh, talk about <laughs> I can talk about Thomas Jefferson all day. I'll just keep. <laughs> I think a lot of people can. <laughs> oh. By the way, um, you know, if you go to my Facebook page, I'm, Thomas Jefferson's birthday is on the 13th. I'm going to be interviewed twice on one in the Charlottesville radio station, one at a local Lynchburg radio station. You can find out that on my Facebook page. Is that right? Um, yes, I have it. Um, I have it on mine. I'll share the. I'll share it to our um, to the Thomas Jefferson Bring Him Home to Monticello page, Citizens okay. for Change. Yeah, yes. we have that. Then I'm going to be uh, talking about Thomas Jefferson, Sally Hemings for Abbeville Institute on the uh, 14th um, at 7:30 at night, and uh, that's a podcast, and you need to pay to sign up for that. So please do. There's a limit of 500. And then on the Friday, the 15th, I'll be interviewed on uh, the right perspective on something to do with Thomas Jefferson for his birthday. Don't yet know what we're going to be doing there. So go back to the, look at the Facebook page. Um, my Mark Kolachek Facebook page as well as the Thomas Jefferson Bring Him Home in Monticello for information on Jefferson's birthday, which they won't be celebrating in Charlottesville once again because he's a hypocrite racist and he uh, raped Sally Emmings. Uh, Never happened, folks. Sorry. <laughs> all right. That's all I have to say for today. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. And um, if you'd like to contact Dr. Holacek, you can reach him at mholacek at hotmail.com or his Facebook page, Thomas Jefferson, Bring Him Home to Monticello, Citizens for Change. And he's also has a YouTube channel. Is that um, Mark Holacek? On YouTube? Mark Holacek, or if you look under Thomas Jefferson, you'll probably find me. Okay. Uh, I, I want to plug this book here too. It's yes, from, the book from which we got the letter. It is called uh, The Scholars Thomas Jefferson Vital Writings of a Vital American by Cambridge Scholars Press. It's not a cheap book, but it's under $100, uh, but it does have important political writings, important ethical religious writings, important ethical writings, 
letters, especially, and then there's a sort of uh, something I call collectania, where we have certain, like a like an encyclopedia entry for Jefferson on philosophy, poetry, politics, public education. It's alphabetic, but it's relatively new, and it's an excellent book. So uh, if you're interested in Thomas Jefferson's writings, uh, this is a great place to start. And can you find that on Amazon? Um, on Amazon, on anything, just type in The Scholars Thomas Jefferson by M. Andrew Polichek. Okay. It's Great. published by Cambridge Scholars Press. Okay, wonderful. Oh, and also you have uh, one of your books was just chosen to be published Leatherbound, too. Yeah, sounds kind of kinky, doesn't it? Great fun. What is it? <laughs> Griffith Press, yeah, it was a signal honor for me. I didn't quite understand it at the time, but uh, they publish, it's a who's who of the great books tradition in their estimation. Jefferson's Notes on Virginia is published. John Adams' works are published. Gordon Woods, uh, as well as other important American historians. So to be included among some of those excellent scholars, world scholars, world historians, is, uh, is, is to me a signal honor. I'm very, very proud of that. Yes, you, should, you ought they'll, to They'll be. be publishing, I, I think I signed something like 500 autographs that'll go into 500 of the books if you want to. And they're reasonably priced for leather, for leather books. We'll talk more about that when it comes up. Okay, great. And I'll be sharing all of that information on my Facebook page as well. Um, okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Holacek. This was a wonderful discussion today and I'm looking forward to next week. <laughs> yeah, when we do that, you know, you always, Claim that I'm worthy. You're a little verbose yourself today. So that was okay. <laughs> that was all right. We'll see everybody next week. And uh, thank you for interviewing me, Donna. And I hope you have a great afternoon. Sunny. Thank you. You too. Bye -bye. <laughs> thank you for joining us, everyone. Have a wonderful day. See you next week.